Section 15 of the Critique of Practical Reason by Immanuel Kant, translated by Thomas Kingsmill Abbott. First Part, Elements of Pure Practical Reason, Book 2, Dialectic of Pure Practical Reason, Chapter 2, of the Dialectic of Pure Reason in Defining the Conception of the Summum Bonum. 5. The Existence of God as a Postulate of Pure Practical Reason. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. In the foregoing analysis, the moral law led to a practical problem, which is prescribed by pure reason alone, without the aid of any sensible motives, namely, that of the necessary completeness of the first and principal element of the summum bonum, that is, morality. And, as this can be perfectly solved only in eternity, to the postulate of immortality. The same law must also lead us to affirm the possibility of the second element of the summum bonum, that is, happiness proportioned to that morality, and this on grounds as disinterested as before, and solely from impartial reason, that is, it must lead to the supposition of the existence of a cause adequate to this effect, that is, it must lead to the supposition of the existence of a cause adequate to this effect. In other words, it must postulate the existence of God as the necessary condition of the possibility of the summum bonum, an object of the will which is necessarily connected with the moral legislation of pure reason. We proceed to exhibit this connection in a convincing manner. Happiness is the condition of a rational being in the world with whom everything goes according to his wish and will. It rests, therefore, on the harmony of physical nature with his whole end, and likewise with the essential determining principle of his will. Now, the moral law as a law of freedom commands by determining principles, which ought to be quite independent of nature and of its harmony with our faculty of desire, as springs, but the acting rational being in the world is not the cause of the world and of nature itself. There is not the least ground, therefore, in the moral law for a necessary connection between morality and proportioned happiness in a being that belongs to the world as part of it, and therefore dependent on it, and which for that reason cannot by his will be a cause of this nature, nor by his own power make it thoroughly harmonize, as far as his happiness is concerned, with his practical principles. Nevertheless, in the practical problem of pure reason, that is, the necessary pursuit of the summum bonum, such a connection is postulated as necessary. We ought to endeavour to promote the summum bonum, which, therefore, must be possible. Accordingly, the existence of a cause of all nature, distinct from nature itself, and containing the principle of this connection, namely, of the exact harmony of happiness with morality, is also postulated. Now, this supreme cause must contain the principle of the harmony of nature, not merely with the law of the will of rational beings, but with the conception of this law, in so far as they make it the supreme determining principle of the will, and consequently not merely with the form of morals, but with their morality as their motive, that is, with their moral character. Therefore, the summum bonum is possible in the world only on the supposition of a supreme being having a causality corresponding to moral character. Now, a being that is capable of acting on the conception of laws is an intelligence, a rational being. And the causality of such a being, according to this conception of laws, is his will. Therefore, the supreme cause of nature which must be presupposed as a condition of the summum bonum, is a being which is the cause of nature by intelligence and will, consequently its author, that is, God. It follows that the postulate of the possibility of the highest derived good, the best world, is likewise the postulate of the reality of a highest original good, that is to say, of the existence of God. Now it was seen to be a duty for us to promote the summum bonum. Consequently, it is not merely allowable, but it is a necessity connected with duty as a requisite, that we should presuppose the possibility of this summum bonum. And as this is possible only on condition of the existence of God, it inseparably connects the supposition of this with duty, that is, 
it is morally necessary to assume the existence of God. It must be remarked here that this moral necessity is subjective, that is, it is a want, and not objective, that is, itself a duty, for there cannot be a duty to suppose the existence of anything, since this concerns only the theoretical employment of reason. Moreover, it is not meant by this that it is necessary to suppose the existence of God as a basis of all obligation in general. For this rests, as has been sufficiently proved, simply on the autonomy of reason itself. What belongs to duty here is only the endeavour to realise and promote the summum bonum in the world, the possibility of which can therefore be postulated, and as our reason finds it not conceivable except on the supposition of a supreme intelligence, the admission of this existence is therefore connected with the consciousness of our duty, although the admission itself belongs to the domain of speculative reason. Considered in respect of this alone, as a principle of explanation, it may be called a hypothesis, but in reference to the intelligibility of an object given us by the moral law, the summum bonum, and consequently of a requirement for practical purposes, it may be called faith, that is to say, a pure rational faith, since pure reason, both in its theoretical and practical use, is the sole source from which it springs. From this deduction it is now intelligible why the Greek schools could never attain the solution of their problem of the practical possibility of the summum bonum, because they made the rule of the use which the will of man makes of his freedom the sole and sufficient ground of this possibility, thinking that they had no need for that purpose of the existence of God. No doubt they were so far right that they established the principle of morals of itself independently of this postulate, from the relation of reason only to the will, and consequently made it the supreme practical condition of the summum bonum. But it was not therefore the whole condition of its possibility. The Epicureans had indeed assumed as the supreme principle of morality a wholly false one, namely that of happiness, and had substituted for a law a maxim of arbitrary choice according to every man's inclination. They proceeded, however, consistently enough in this, that they degraded their summum bonum likewise, just in proportion to the meanness of their fundamental principle, and looked for no greater happiness than can be attained by human prudence, including temperance and moderation of the inclinations. And this, as we know, would be scanty enough, and would be very different according to circumstances, not to mention the exceptions that their maxims must perpetually admit, and which make them incapable of being laws. The Stoics, on the contrary, had chosen their supreme practical principle quite rightly, making virtue the condition of the summum bonum. But when they represented the degree of virtue required by its pure law as fully attainable in this life, they not only strained the moral powers of the man whom they called the wise beyond all the limits of his nature, and assumed the thing that contradicts all our knowledge of men, but also and principally they would not allow the second element of the summum bonum, namely happiness, to be properly a special object of human desire, but made their wise man, like a divinity in his consciousness of the excellence of his person, wholly independent of nature, as regards his own contentment. They exposed him indeed to the evils of life, but made him not subject to them, at the same time representing him also as free from moral evil. They thus, in fact, left out the second element of the summum bonum, namely personal happiness, placing it solely in action and satisfaction with one's own personal worth, thus including it in the consciousness of being morally minded, in which they might have been sufficiently refuted by the voice of their own nature. The doctrine of Christianity, even if we do not yet consider it as a religious doctrine, gives, touching this point, a conception of the summum bonum, the kingdom of God, which alone satisfies the strictest demand of practical reason. The moral law is holy, unyielding, and demands holiness of morals, although all the moral perfection to which man can attain is still only virtue, that is, a rightful disposition arising from respect for the law, implying consciousness of a constant propensity to transgression, or at least a want of purity, 
that is, a mixture of many spurious, not moral, motives of obedience to the law. Consequently, a self-esteem combined with humility. In respect, then, of the holiness which the Christian law requires, this leaves the creature nothing but a progress in infinitum. But for that very reason it justifies him in hoping for an endless duration of his existence. The worth of a character, perfectly accordant with a moral law, is infinite. Since the only restriction on all possible happiness in the judgment of a wise and all-powerful distributor of it is the absence of conformity of rational beings to their duty. But the moral law of itself does not promise any happiness, for according to our conceptions of an order of nature in general, this is not necessarily connected with obedience to the law. Now Christian morality supplies this defect, of the second indispensable element of the summum bonum, by representing the world in which rational beings devote themselves with all their soul to the moral law, as a kingdom of God, in which nature and morality are brought into a harmony foreign to each of itself, by a holy author who makes the derived summum bonum possible. Holiness of life is prescribed to them as a rule even in this life, while the welfare proportioned to it, namely bliss, is represented as attainable only in an eternity, because the former must always be the pattern of their conduct in every state, and progress towards it is already possible and necessary in this life, while the latter, under the name of happiness, cannot be attained at all in this world, so far as our own power is concerned, and therefore is made simply an object of hope. Nevertheless, the Christian principle of morality itself is not theological, so as to be heteronomy, but is autonomy of pure practical reason, since it does not make the knowledge of God and his will the foundation of these laws, but only of the attainment of the summum bonum, on condition of following these laws, and it does not even place the proper spring of this obedience in the desired results, but solely in the conception of duty, as that of which the faithful observance alone constitutes the worthiness to obtain those happy consequences. Footnote. It is commonly held that the Christian precept of morality has no advantage in respect of purity over the moral conceptions of the Stoics. The distinction between them is, however, very obvious. The Stoic system made the consciousness of strength of mind the pivot on which all moral dispositions should turn, and although its disciples spoke of duties and even defined them very well, yet they placed the spring and proper determining principle of the will in an elevation of the mind above the lower springs of the senses, which owe their power only to weakness of mind. With them, therefore, virtue was a sort of heroism in the wise man, raising himself above the animal nature of man, is sufficient for himself, and, while he prescribes duties to others, is himself raised above them, and is not subject to any temptation to transgress the moral law. All this, however, they could not have done if they had conceived this law in all its purity and strictness, as the precept of the gospel does. When I give the name idea to a perfection to which nothing adequate can be given in experience, it does not follow that the moral ideas are things transcendent, that is, something of which we could not even determine the concept adequately, or of which it is uncertain whether there is any object corresponding to it at all as is the case with the ideas of speculative reason. On the contrary, being types of practical perfection, they serve as the indispensable rule of conduct, and likewise as the standard of comparison. Now, if I consider Christian morals on their philosophical side, then compared with the ideas of the Greek schools, they would appear as follows. The ideas of the Cynics, the Epicureans, the Stoics, and the Christians are simplicity of nature, prudence, wisdom, and holiness. In respect of the way of attaining them, the Greek schools were distinguished from one another thus, that the cynics only required common sense, the others the path of science, but both found the mere use of natural powers sufficient for the purpose. Christian morality, because its precept is framed, as a moral precept must be, so pure and unyielding, takes from man all confidence that he can be fully adequate to it at least in this life, 
but again sets it up by enabling us to hope that if we act as well as it is in our power to do, then what is not in our power will come into our aid from another source, whether we know how this may be or not. Aristotle and Plato differed only as to the origin of our moral conceptions. And footnote. In this manner, the moral laws led through the conception of the summum bonum as the object and final end of pure practical reason to religion, that is, to the recognition of all duties as divine commands, not as sanctions, that is to say, arbitrary ordinances of a foreign and contingent in themselves, but as essential laws of every free will in itself, which, nevertheless, must be regarded as commands of the supreme being, because it is only from a morally perfect, holy and good, and at the same time all-powerful will, and consequently only through harmony with this will, that we can hope to attain the summum bonum which the moral law makes it our duty to take as the object of our endeavours. Here again, then, all remains disinterested and founded merely on duty, neither fear nor hope being made the fundamental springs, which, if taken as principles, would destroy the whole moral worth of actions. The moral law commands me to make the highest possible good in a world the ultimate object of all my conduct. But I cannot hope to effect this otherwise than by the harmony of my will with that of a holy and good author of the world. And although the conception of the summum bonum as a whole, in which the greatest happiness is conceived as combined in the most exact proportion with the highest degree of moral perfection, possible in creatures, includes my own happiness, yet it is not this that is the determining principle of the will which is enjoined to promote the summum bonum, but the moral law which, on the contrary, limits by strict conditions my unbounded desire of happiness. Hence also morality is not properly the doctrine how we should make ourselves happy, but how we should become worthy of happiness. It is only when religion is added that there also comes in the hope of participating some day in happiness in proportion as we have endeavoured to be not unworthy of it. A man is worthy to possess a thing or a state when his possession of it is in harmony with the summum bonum. We can now easily see that all worthiness depends on moral conduct, since in the conception of the summum bonum this constitutes the condition of the rest, which belongs to one's state, namely the participation of happiness. Now it follows from this that morality should never be treated as a doctrine of happiness, that is, an instruction how to become happy. For it has to do simply with a rational condition, conditio sine qua non, of happiness, not with the means of attaining it. But when morality has been completely expounded, which merely imposes duties instead of providing rules for selfish desires, then first after the moral desire to promote the summum bonum, to bring the kingdom of God to us, has been awakened, a desire founded on a law, and which could not previously arise in any selfish mind, and when for the behoof of this desire the step to religion has been taken, then this ethical doctrine may be also called a doctrine of happiness, because the hope of happiness first begins with religion only. We can also see from this that, when we ask what is God's ultimate end in creating the world, we must not name the happiness of the rational beings in it, but the summum bonum, which adds a further condition to that wish of such beings, namely the condition of being worthy of happiness, that is, the morality of these same rational beings, a condition which alone contains the rule by which only they can hope to share in the former at the hand of a wise author. For, as wisdom, theoretically considered, signifies the knowledge of the summum bonum, and, practically, the accordance of the will with the summum bonum, we cannot attribute to a supreme independent wisdom an end based merely on goodness. For we cannot conceive the action of this goodness, in respect of the happiness of rational beings, as suitable to the highest original good, except under the restrictive conditions of harmony with the holiness of his will. Footnote. In order to make these characteristics of these conceptions clear, I add the remark that whilst we ascribe to God various attributes, 
the quality of which we also find applicable to creatures, only that in him they are raised to the highest degree, for example, power, knowledge, presence, goodness, etc., under the designations of omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, etc. There are three that are ascribed to God exclusively, and yet without the addition of greatness, and which are all moral. He is the only holy, the only blessed, the only wise, because these conceptions already imply the absence of limitation. In the order of these attributes he is also the holy lawgiver and creator, the good governor and preserver, and the just judge, three attributes which include everything by which God is the object of religion, and in conformity with which the metaphysical perfections are added of themselves in the reason. End footnote. Therefore, those who place the end of creation in the glory of God, provided that this is not conceived anthropomorphically as a desire to be praised, have perhaps hit upon the best expression. For nothing glorifies God more than that which is the most estimable thing in the world, respect for his command, the observance of the holy duty that his law imposes on us, when there is added thereto his glorious plan of crowning such a beautiful order of things with corresponding happiness. If the latter, to speak humanly, makes him worthy of love, by the former he is an object of adoration. Even men can never acquire respect by benevolence alone, though they may gain love, so that the greatest beneficence only procures them honour when it is regulated by worthiness. That in the order of ends man, and with him every rational being, is an end in himself, that is, that he can never be used merely as a means by any, not even by God, without being at the same time an end also himself, that therefore humanity in our person must be holy to ourselves, this follows now of itself, because he is the subject of the moral law, in other words, of that which is holy in itself, and on account of which, and in agreement with which alone, can anything be termed holy. For this moral law is founded on the autonomy of his will, as a free will which, by its universal laws, must necessarily be able to agree with that to which it is to submit itself. End of section 15